Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're doing something a little different. It's gonna be common job site terms. You could call this a construction terms 101 or basic construction terms explained. This is for anybody who has zero experience in the industry, zero experience even with shovels. These are some of the things you might wanna know your first day on the job. So I'm gonna go through some common things, break them down for you so that maybe when you go on the job your first time, you don't necessarily look quite as ignorant as you are in this very moment. So let's get started. Term number one, superintendent. Superintendent is going to be the guy that is over the entire job. He's going to be all facets of the job. It is his job to keep that project on time. He's going to be the big boss, the biggest boss probably on that job site. Our second term is gonna be foreman. Depending on the size of the job that you're on, your foreman could act as the superintendent if there is only one foreman on the job, or he could be one of the foremen on a large scale project. So for instance, I used to work with some major projects where we would have a dirt foreman, we would have a sewer crew foreman, we would have a restoration foreman. All of those foremen are over their different aspects of the job. They all fall under and answer to the superintendent. Term number three, material. Material is a term that you're gonna hear all over the job site, and it's not one thing specifically. Material is generally referring to dirt, sand, or stone. It is the generic broad term for stuff that needs to get moved. So for instance, behind me, you see this pile of sand. That's material. Uh, the dirt that was moved back over here to dig out this foundation, that's also material. If we had stone for the driveway, that would also be a type of material. Whenever you hear material referenced on a job site, you aren't specifically referring to one thing. It's just something that needs to be moved. It's some sort of aggregate. All right, the next term we're gonna go over is called the right of way. So what is the right of way? This term is used in a couple different ways. So if you're on a job site, on a larger construction site, you will have a construction site right of way. It's generally marked out with construction stakes along the edges of the job. That is the job site. That is the area that you are okay to be in. It's the area that you're okay to tear up. It's the area that you have the green light to do whatever you need to do in. The other Another common time you will hear this is when it comes to utilities, gas pipelines, large electric lines. The clearing that the pipeline sits in or the construction lines are going through, that clearing is also referred to as the right of way. And it basically says this is a sectioned off portion of space that is reserved for the job or for whatever utility that it's referencing. Our next term, cut. Cut is exactly what it sounds like. Anytime you have to remove material, it is a cut. For instance, back here behind us, they actually had to grade this pad off a little bit and they had to remove some material on the front side of where the foundation was gonna sit. That is a cut. When you are removing material, it is a cut. That leads us into our next term, which is fill. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a fairly straightforward term. When you remove material from the cut, you generally take it to the fill. The fill is any area that needs to be built up with material. So the next term we're gonna talk about is subgrade. Subgrade is essentially the lowest level of material that you're going to excavate down to. So in other words, when we're building a road, the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to dig out the area where the road is going to sit. And we're gonna take that down below all of the topsoil, all of the organics and roots and all of that stuff. What we're trying to do is get down to good, firm material that's gonna support our road beds. When we do that, that will be graded level and smooth. That will be our subgrade. From there, we will place our stone above that, and then we will build our road. So the lowest bottom point that you are going to excavate down to is referred to as your subgrade. Next term we're gonna go over is finish grade. You're gonna hear this thrown around all the time or when something's finished. Basically, a finish grade is the final grade. It's flattened, it's compacted, it's ready for whatever the next step is. So if we're building a road, that would be you're ready for concrete or or you're ready for asphalt. Uh, if we're building a house back here, finish grade generally is going to refer to the lot after you've graded it and it all drains properly and it's ready for topsoil. So finish grade is just a grade that has been finished and is ready for the next step or in, you know, in cases like this house behind me, a finish grade is what it is. It's ready for grass. There is no next step. All right, the next term we're gonna talk about gets us into the land of trenches and ditches and excavating. 
Uh, our first term in this world is bench. You're gonna hear the word bench talked about all the time when there is a trench involved or a hole of any type. A bench is basically where you stair step the sides of the hole down so that it's not a vertical wall. This is done not only because it's required by law via OSHA, but it's also a really nice thing to do for the person who has to get in the hole because it makes it far less dangerous. The whole idea behind benching your hole is it prevents cave-ins and collapses. And because you've created a bench system, you now have a way that if it starts to collapse, a bench will catch most of the material before it falls in the hole and hits whoever is down in the hole, putting in pipe or whatever is happening down in the hole. The next term we're gonna talk about when it comes to backfilling those trenches that we just made is lift. A lift of dirt is generally a set amount of material that's gonna go back in the hole that has to be compacted before you can then follow with more material. So in other words, if we had a six foot deep hole or a six foot deep trench, an inspector is never gonna let you backfill that six foot all the way to the top and then compact it and get you know the first eight inches of compaction and call it good. The way it works in the construction industry is you backfill in what's called lifts. So what we would do is we would have our six foot deep hole, we would backfill with one foot of material, that material would be leveled and compacted, then you would follow it with another lift and you would do lifts all the way until we got to the top of the hole. That ensures that the hole is compacted all the way from the bottom you're not going to get any settling afterwards that's going to cause problems or potentially be hazardous down the road all right the next term we're going to talk about is base base is something that's going to go over our subgrade so once we have our subgrade graded and compacted and flattened everything's ready for the next step that's when we're going to put in our base material a base material is going to generally be a larger type of aggregate it's going to be a very stable material it's going to be a weight bearing material and the whole idea behind the base is it is a foundation for whatever you're building so again my background is road building we would base with stone and it was a very stable base for the asphalt that was about to follow slopes we're gonna talk a little bit about slopes we could probably do an entire video on slopes especially when it comes to reading slope grade stakes that will be down the road but let's just talk about slopes for a second a slope is just dirt at an angle this is a slope this is a slope this is also a slope. It doesn't have to be any specific angle to be considered a slope. Anytime you have to grade dirt and it has an angle or a pitch to it, it's considered a slope. So there's going to be two parts to a slope. There's gonna be the toe of the slope, which is the bottom where the slope meets the flat area. So if you imagine a ditch or something, the toe of the slope is where either the two pieces of the ditch meet or the, the slope coming down to a flat area. This would be the toe of the slope right here where my finger is. It's the bottom of the slope where the slope ends. Top of slope is obviously going to be the top of the slope. When you're talking about slopes, the other thing you're gonna be talking about is pitch. Pitch is rise over run. In other words, if we have a one over two slope, that means that for every one foot that the dirt goes up, it goes horizontally two feet. If we break that way down and simplify it, let's take a simple one to one slope. A one to one slope is pretty much a 45 degree angle. When you fall one foot, you also move horizontally horizontally one foot. That's a 45 degree angle. Now if we move to a one over two slope, you get a little more run. It's a little less. If you start talking about a one over five, you have a really, really gradual slope that's going to be more something like you'd find in a backyard at a house or something. So that's how you talk about slopes is rise over run. Next term we're going to talk about is a berm. Berms are pretty straightforward. It's basically a long dirt pile. Safety berms are something you'll commonly see on large job sites where there is some sort of an edge that trucks could go off of. What the dozer operator will often do is leave a slight pile of dirt that's maybe a foot tall, foot and a half tall, a couple feet thick, and it will go the entire length of whatever the drop off is. It is a safety berm. The idea being that a truck will back up, hit that, feel the resistance, and they won't back up over the edge. You can also have larger types of berms that are actually part of your finish grade. You'll see this all the time alongside highways. There's large portions of topsoil that weren't necessarily needed to complete the job, and so they will mound them up in these large berms, and then they'll smooth them over so that they look halfway decent, and that's just where it gets left until they redo the highway in another decade or two. Berms don't have to be small, they can be larger, but it is essentially a very long dirt pile. The next term we're gonna talk about is crown. So this is something that especially comes into play in road building. A crown is a high point in a particular area, and the whole idea behind a crown is it's going to force water to run off 
one direction or another so that it doesn't just stay stagnant on the road. Again, I know road building, let's stick with that. If we didn't put a crown in the middle of a road, it would be perfectly flat, which means anytime it rained, the rain would just sit on the road, it would cause you to hydroplane much more frequently. So what engineers do, and what the construction industry then translates into the road that you drive on is, we put a slight crown in the road. The crown is the very top of that slope, and it makes sure there is a high point so that that water will drain off of the road quick so that cars can safely drive on it even in heavy rains. That being said, that's not something that is strictly in the road world. You typically will talk about a crown when you're finished grading a residential lot, for instance. If there's a high point in the yard where everything drains away from, that will be the crown in the yard. The next term we're gonna talk about, again, going back to my road building roots, edge drain. Edge drain is a corrugated plastic pipe that is perforated. It has fairly large holes. They're probably half inch in diameter, maybe three quarter inch in diameter. It's generally, I think four or six inch, I can't remember which. And I don't have a piece handy to, to kind of jog my memory. But it's, it's a relatively large corrugated pipe. And the entire reason that exists is to drain water away from the bottom of the road uh, so that you don't get pumping. It doesn't soften the ground as more and more traffic drives over a wet spot. It collects that water dumps it into the stormwater system. Edge drain isn't specific to the road building industry. You see it all over the place. In fact, it's also called drain tile. If you've heard that in farmer's field or if you've heard uh, drain tile going in around a basement to drain waterway, it's the same stuff as drain tile. It serves the same purpose. It's just a pipe that is designed to pull groundwater out of the ground and take it someplace so that it doesn't cause large soft spots in an area that you need to stay firm and stable. Another common job site term that you're gonna hear, especially in road building, is structure. We're not referring to houses or buildings in this instance. When you refer to a structure, you are talking about the concrete vault that a manhole sits over. The entire purpose of a structure is it is where two pipes join together at an angle because with concrete storm pipe, you can't just turn in a circle or you can't cut off at a 45 degree angle. You have to have some sort of place where those pipes can come into a pocket that gathers the water and that is a structure. That's where you see catch basins, manholes, under each one of those that you see in the road is a large concrete vault and that is a structure. The next term we're going to talk about is going to be critical if you do any sort of pipeline, whether it's on a pipeline or if it's just working on an underground crew doing storm, sanitary sewer, or water. This term is called an invert. An invert refers to the bottom of the inside of a pipe. And I will flash a picture so you know what I'm talking about because this is an important thing to understand. It is not the bottom of the outside of the pipe. It is the bottom of the inside of the pipe. And why is that a term all on its own? Why do we even care about that? Well, it's actually really important. If you think about you have a pipe here, you have a pipe here, and you want the water to run, a crucial measurement is the level of not the bottom of my fingers, but the top of my fingers. If we took our measurement off the bottom, that means that there would be this weird disconnect. The invert, the inside of the bottom of the pipe, is the measurement we need to take to make sure that everything is going to line up and that we have flow which is gonna be one direction or the other, depending on which way we have it tipped. So that is a very, very important term for you to know if you do any sort of pipe work. All right, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is grade stakes. What are grade stakes? Well, we're gonna do an entire video just on grade stakes. But essentially, dumb it down for this video, a grade stake is a wood stake that's put in the ground that has critical information written on it. This information can just depend on the type of grade stake. Some of them are just informational, telling you whether this is back of curb or whether it's a five foot offset from something else. Other stakes get more important where they have cut and fill information. So cut and fill stakes will actually have written on them C or an F for cut or fill, and then it will have a number on it. For instance, 1.27, that's one point two seven feet it's not one inch it's one foot and 27 hundredths we'll get into tens and hundredths here shortly that's another term we're going to go over but just to know that grade stakes are very very important on job sites you don't ever mess with grade stakes unless you're told to or you know for a fact 100,000 percent you don't need it anymore they are some of the most important pieces of information on a job site the next term we're going to talk about feeds directly into that 
lath. The first time anyone ever told me get a piece of lath out of the back of a truck, I had no idea what they were talking about. I went over to the edge of the truck and was looking all through it and had zero idea what they were talking about. A piece of lath is a grade stake without any writing on it. Don't look like an idiot like I did the first time someone used that. Just know flat out that's a grade stake with no writing on it. Or you can still refer to a grade stake as a piece of lath. Next one we're going to talk about is a hub. This is different than a grade stake and I'm going to try to flash to either a video or a picture of one. It is a square stake that has got some meat to it and the reason they do that is because hubs are not meant to move they're meant to be very very stable generally hubs are used as control points which is going to be our next term don't get excited they're going to be used as some sort of stationary point that we have to take measurements off of they're generally pretty long they're about i don't know 10 inches long but you'll only see a couple inches sticking above the ground the reason they drive them so deep is they want that stake to be stable so that they can set an elevation or something off of it that is a hub and it is very different than a grade stake most of the time grade stakes will be around a hub referring some sort of information whether it's an offset stake or if it's got information pertaining to the hub what the elevation is but the hub is the critical measurement point that brings us into what is a control point a control point is one of the most important things on a job site and you don't ever mess with one a control point is where an engineering firm has come out with very sophisticated equipment and they have set a very very specific location and elevation and transferred it to that stake so a control point is set to a specific elevation you don't stand on a control point you don't do anything to that stake the only thing you should be doing with a control point is very lightly setting your grade rod on it and taking your elevation measurement outside of that you don't mess with control points they are very very critical and some of them are actually used to set up the engineer's equipment so those are extra critical don't mess with control points so another term that I thought I would throw in here that's kind of random, doesn't really go with anything else, but at the same time you might want to know on larger jobs, a water tree. A water tree is essentially something you hook up to a fire hydrant that will send the water up and over top of your water wagon or your water truck, whatever you have on your specific job. Uh, instead of having to get out of the cab and manually hook up a hose to the back of it and let it pump water up, a water tree is something that you will actually drive under and it will sit over top of the truck and fill it from the top. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about, I actually have an example here in my hand, a probe rod. It generally looks like a big T with a tip on the end of it that's a little pointed. It's not gonna be a very sharp tip, and the reason we do that is because this is used for locating utilities. The way that you're gonna do this, you hold it by the T, and you're going to probe down into the ground here. You're gonna use your body weight to push this down in the ground. You use a probe rod to assist with digging for utilities with a machine. So what you'll do is you'll probe an area a couple inches apart between your probes. That way, if there's any pipes in there, you'll feel them with the probe rod instead of grabbing them with the machine. Once you've probed down and you know an area is safe, the machine can come in, take a couple of scoops, and then you go back at it with your probe rod. This is a critical, critical tool anytime you're doing something around sensitive utilities or anything like that. Sticking with our tool vein, next we're gonna talk about shovels. I know this is very basic, but that's who I'm gearing this video for. We're gonna talk about the difference between a spade shovel and a flat shovel. They're both shovels, they're both very different. A flat shovel is gonna be used for doing mostly cleanup work. It's gonna be uh, used for leveling surfaces. A spade shovel is really made for digging. It's made for getting down in the dirt and taking a lot of material out. They have two very, very unique differences. The way they're shaped, they have two very unique jobs. Make sure you know the difference so you don't sound like an idiot. All right, the next term we're gonna talk about is a laser. I actually don't have a laser on me right now and it's currently being used back here in the background behind me so I can't run over there and show you. But a laser sits on a tripod and its sole purpose is to, when you turn it on, as long as it's within a, a base amount of level, it has to be relatively close, it will level itself and then it will turn on and start rotating at a high rate of speed. You couple that with a laser eye, which you use on your grade rod, which we we will talk about in a second. And what it does is it sends a flat level laser 
across your job site so that when you're grading, you know where you're at on grade. Some of the lasers get a little more sophisticated and can actually, once they've leveled themselves, you can put a 2%, 3%, 4% slope on them. And so you can actually grade to a slope, but it's important that you line up with the laser so that you're actually grading to the slope you have set. The next tool we're gonna to talk about goes directly with your laser. It is a grade rod or a story rod. The reason this is called a story rod, it actually has numbers on it. So one thing you're gonna notice about this particular grade rod is the numbers go up to 12 when you hit your new foot. This is a feet and inches grade rod. The more common grade rod you're gonna see on jobs is a 10th grade rod. Tenths are tenths of a foot. If you do the math on that, you take 12 inches in a foot, you divide it by 10 because we are doing tenths, a tenth is roughly equivalent to 1.2 inches. And when I say roughly equivalent, I mean mathematically a tenth of a foot is exactly 1.2 inches. I don't know why I said that it's close to or whatever I just said. All that to say, the other thing you're going to notice about this is that the numbers are increasing as they get higher. So what you would do is you would throw this up, put your laser eye on here, and then you would move it around until you figure out where your laser level is, and that will tell you how many feet off of the ground you're sitting right now. You would then transfer that to another area of the job. We will do a whole video on how to use a laser and a grade rod down the road. I just want you to be familiar with this and don't be shocked if your grade rod has tenths on it instead of 12 full individual inches. The final thing I want to talk about on this video is not necessarily a vocabulary word, but after talking with people in the in the different Facebook groups and everything, I 100% agree it's something that should be addressed early on before you get too far down the road in this industry, and that is utility locates and colors. What do they mean? So a utility locate is when the location service comes out. A lot of times you see, I think it's USIC that comes out. Uh, there's a handful of other ones. Here in Michigan, you call Mystig to come out and mark them. It is a location service that uses different tools to locate gas, power, sanitary sewer, water. All of those will be located so that before you start digging, you have a good idea of where they're at. The important thing for you to know is what those colors mean. So the first color is yellow. Yellow stands for gas lines, and this is consistent through the industry. If you ever dig up a gas line, you will see that the pipe they use is yellow. Yellow stands for gas. The next color is red. Red is electrical. That one's a fairly easy one for me to remember just because red means danger. Electricity is one of the quickest ways you can kill yourself. Red is for electricity. Orange is our next color. That's gonna be communications. It can be fiber optic. It can be phone line. It can be cable for internet. All three of those will be orange. They will be flagged as orange. The next color is gonna be blue. If you can't figure that one out, you might wanna rethink getting into this industry. Blue stands for water. It's pretty straightforward. The next color is gonna be brown. Brown is going to be sanitary sewer. It's gonna be marked occasionally. You don't necessarily you see it all the time in big jobs, just depending on where you're at. We saw it a lot on the residential side. The final color that you may see, it will be ultra rare if you do, uh, outside of maybe golf courses, is purple. Purple stands for reclaimed water. It is not to be mixed. The reason they mark it differently than regular water is because you do not mix regular water and reclaimed water. They should never, ever, ever get tied into each other. It causes contamination. So purple is reclaimed water. So I hope this has been helpful. I know this is a lot to take in. This is probably a bit of a lengthy video, but at the same time, these are some of the basic terms to kind of get you through your first week on the job. If you guys have any other questions, if I kind of skimmed over something that you'd like more information on, absolutely don't hesitate to reach out to me and shoot me a message and I'll do what I can to help you out. In the meantime, if you don't mind, hit the subscribe button and we'll see you on the next video.